Hello everyone and welcome to part one where we're going to be discussing tables in HTML. Tables in HTML consist of several tags working together and those tags are the general table tag that lets your HTML know that there's going to be a table here. Then there's the T head tag which allows you to actually set the first row or the header row of the table and then inside of that you have TH which are the actual elements that we're going to be placing inside of that header or head row, that very top row. Essentially the name of the columns in the table. And then beyond that you have the table rows and then you have TD for each of the table elements inside corresponding to each column. Now here I've shown the breakdown with just the opening tags. Every opening tag would later on have a corresponding closing tag. So with that being said, let's go ahead and construct the table to understand all of this and get a real sense of how all these different tags work together. I'm going to jump to the Atom Text Editor now. All right, here I am at the Atom Text Editor and I also have a browser open to the HTML file I'm working with right now, which is just called tables.html. You can call your HTML file whatever you want. Let me just collapse that side directory so we can see the full HTML file a little better. The first tag we're going to need is the table tag, which is basically going to declare that we have a table. And I'm just going to autocomplete that there. And everything we're working with is going to go inside these table tags. First thing we want to do after that is the table head, which is T head. And this is where your column names are going to go. So right now, if we save this and refresh our web page, we don't see anything because we really don't have any content in the table yet. But as I put a th, which is basically the actual content that goes in the table head, we'll do something like number. Now my table will show something. And here it is, just a number. And let's add a couple more th elements or th tags for something like color. And then let's add another one, th, and we'll do country. Save that, refresh over here. And now I have number, color, country. And note how they're aligned. They're aligned as if they are the titles of the column names that are going to be coming up. So now the question is, how do we actually add rows to the table? And then how do we actually add table cells? Well, outside of this T head, we say TR, and that's going to stand for a table row. And now what we can do is inside of this table row, put in TD for table cells. So let's start off with a number. And that corresponds with the first column, which is the number column. Let's put in the next cell, and this is in the first row, that first TR, and now we need a color. Let's put in something like red. And now let's put in a country, let's just say USA. We'll save this and refresh, and now we can see that we're actually starting to construct a table. Let me zoom in on this so it's a little more clear. Okay, so we can see we're actually constructing a table. A lot of times you want your table to actually have a border. And we'll be discussing styling tables a lot more when we talk about CSS. But a quick way to do it is in this table tag, just do a space and add in border. And Adam Text Editor is actually going to help you out here. And if you just hit enter here, it'll automatically fill out border for you. And then just pass in a number like one. And then when you refresh this after passing that number in, you get to see this uh, auto border created. And like I mentioned, there's a lot more styling you can do instead of getting like such an ugly border for your table, but right now this will help us differentiate uh, rows and columns. Okay, let's practice adding in one more row. Again, it's TR for the table row, and then TD for the table cell. And let's see what happens if we just add in one table cell value. So if I just put in 100, and I click Save and refresh here, note that I'd still get that 100 value. So I can still add in values and basically have blank values for certain columns. Now it's always suggested that you try to fill out your table completely, but just keep that in mind that your table will still be able to generate. There won't be an error thrown at all if you only have one corresponding value for your row. So let's fill that in. Next one we want is a color. Let's just say blue. Whoops. And let's put in one more, which is going to be a country. And let's just say France. I'm going to save that and let's refresh. And there we have it. One more row. Okay, and that's really all there is to creating tables in HTML. It's pretty straightforward. Let's just quickly review the steps. Everything we've done goes inside these table tags. We have an opening one and a closing one. And then if you want to have a border here, you can just say border is equal to, and then in quotes here I've put in one. 
If we put in larger numbers, such as 5, basically what's going to happen is you will get a thicker border. Now I'm zoomed in here, so the effect is a little more uh, pronounced, but let's make it uh, really large, so we'll say 50, and then refresh. You can see we get a extremely thick border on the outside. So you may be wondering, well, how do I actually edit these borders on the inside? That's something we're going to discuss a lot more in the CSS section of the course. For right now, you can just put in one, and that should make things clear enough as far as what's a row and what's a column. Okay, then after that, we have the T-head section. And the T-head section is differentiated from the TR. Welcome back, everybody, to part two, Tables Quiz. So you've actually learned enough in the previous lecture to get some practice creating your own tables. I want you to open the TXT or text file inside of the HTML level 2 folder called part 2 underscore table underscore quiz dot TXT. And there are some instructions there that we're going to be exploring right now. But basically for this exercise, you're going to be recreating a table based off the information provided in that text file. Let's take a quick look at that text file and then show you an example of what the end result will look like. I'm going to jump to the Atom text editor now. All right, so I've opened up that table quiz.txt file here. And basically what you're going to be doing is using the following information to make a table about country GDP. And it says pop quiz here, but I kind of warned you about this already, so it's not really a totally pop quiz. All the source for this data is from this Wikipedia link on the list of countries by GDP. And what I want you to do is make a table of HTML consisting of three main columns. The country name, the country flags, so that will be an image, and then GDP in millions of US dollars. And your table will have three rows, and you'll use the information below to attribute it to the cells correctly. So you have United States as the first country's name. You have a link for the US flag. So you can see here I have the Wikipedia link to an image of that flag, and then the actual number for GDP, which is here 18,561,930. Then we have India, and I'll have the Indian flag as a link there, and then their GDP, and then we have the United Kingdom, the UK flag, which is a link here, and then their GDP. Let me show you very quickly what the final result you will be creating actually looks like. And here I have open what the basic final result will look like. Notice that I've created a border. We have those three columns, the country name, country flag, GDP in millions of US dollars, and then we have those three rows. And that's basically all there is to it as far as what you're going to be creating. So try your best, just based off of this text file and the information here, to open up a brand new HTML file and recreate this table that looks like this. So three rows, three columns. The A little bit of a tricky part that we haven't shown yet is how to actually insert an image here, but it shouldn't be too different than what we've done before. In fact, you should already know how to do it based off everything we've covered. So definitely take your time, explore, reference Google if you need it, but coming up next is going to be the walkthrough solutions to this exercise. Thanks everyone, and I'll see you at the next lecture. Hello everyone, and welcome to part three, Tables Quiz Solutions. In this lecture, we're just going to be coding through the solutions for the table quiz. Let's get started. All right, so I have my text editor open, and I have my browser open to this tables.html file, which is currently blank. Let me collapse that directory screen, and here I have the actual text file with the quiz instructions, so I can reference this data later on. And remember, we want to just create a table with those three columns and three rows. Let's start off by just creating the HTML file itself. Luckily, we just have to type HT, hit enter, and everything's automatically created there for us. And then here in the body, I'm going to just say something like table, and let's insert a header just to make sure we're properly linked, or a heading, I should say. And we'll say table quiz, save that. Let's refresh this, and here we see table quiz. So we know these are linked together, so we're good to go. I can just delete that heading now, since I know it's linked. And now I have the table. The first thing of this table that I want to create is the T head element. And remember the T head, or the table head, is what actually has the column names. So it has the column names in bold there. And that takes in TH cells, instead of the regular TD cells. And my first column will be the country name. My second column will be the country flag. And then my third column, remember, is the GDP in millions of US dollars. So let's save that and make sure it actually worked for us by refreshing over here. And there we have country name, country flag, GDP, millions of US dollars. But remember that the actual solutions looked like it had a border to it. 
and we covered how to create a border back in the tables lecture. You just come up here to tables, select border equal to, and let's just put in, let's say two. Then we refresh, and now we have that nice border. Now it's just a matter of filling in the information. So the information we have has to go under table rows or TR tags. So here's a table row, and let's start by filling in the first table cells. So the first one we have is USA, that's the first table cell. Then the second one we have, TD, is going to be the actual image of the flag. And in order to put that in, we need to call an image tag. So we didn't actually show this in the table lecture, but all you have to do is just type in image and then put in the source. So we have this image tag that we worked with earlier, and it's just nested inside this TD or table cell tag. And that's really all you had to do for that. Let's grab that USA flag link. So I will copy and paste it from here. So let me copy that. And then paste it inside the source. Save this and let me refresh to make sure everything worked correctly here. And there we have country flag and US. So we're linked correctly. And then finally, the last cell I want for this row is with my TD tags here, table cell, call it. And let me zoom in a little bit so we can see a little better. It's the GDP in millions of US dollars. And from the notes, that's just right here, 18,561, etc. So let's paste that in save it, refresh, and it looks like we're good to go here. We have the country name, country flag, and GDP. Now it's just a matter of duplicating this process for the next two rows. So again, we just say table row, and let's just put in the three cells right now, TD, TD, TD. And the next one we had was India. And then I'm going to put in that image tag again, it's just IMG, hit enter, and it automatically has the SRC or the source for you and we will grab this Indian flag from Wikipedia. And a quick note, sometimes Wikipedia will change the actual links or the size of the picture. So if you're getting some distortion in the size, don't worry. We're gonna cover how to actually set image sizes later on, especially during the CSS lectures. So if you get kind of funky flag sizes, don't worry about it too much. Just make sure you understand the idea of creating the table itself. Don't worry too much about these actual links. In fact, you could replace them with your own links if you wanted to. So I will just copy and paste that flag of India link right there. And then let me put in their GDP. And I have that information right over here. Copy and paste that. Save this and let's make sure the second row worked. All right, perfect. We have India, Indian flag, and then their GDP. And then finally, it's time for the United Kingdom. We'll put in their three cells, TD, TD, TD and we're going to say United Kingdom image source and then their GDP. So let's grab their GDP first, copy and paste that in here, save this and refresh to make sure we still have the connection, perfect. And now it's time for their flag. So let's grab that flag link. I'm going to just copy this from the quiz notes and then paste it in here in their source. Good, let's save that. And now with the refresh here, I see the United Kingdom flag. All right, and that's really all we had to do. So we have the country flags, USA, India, United Kingdom, their flags, and then GDP. All right, so hopefully you found that exercise pretty straightforward. Again, you can always just reference the solutions notebook, or excuse me, the solutions HTML file in case you want to actually reference the code itself. All right, thanks everyone. I hope that was straightforward, and I'll see you at the next lecture. Hello everyone and welcome to part 4, Forms Basics. Creating forms in HTML really revolves around the idea of the input tag. And throughout this lecture and the subsequent lectures, we're going to be looking at various types of inputs for forms and how we can use them to accept user input. So if you've ever visited a website where you had to input your email, a password into a form online and then click submit, that's an HTML form. Forms are actually going to be a key component of Django later on, but in order to really understand how to use them with Django, we need to fully understand them with just pure HTML. Let's get started by looking at some basic examples. I'm going to jump to the text editor now. All right, so I have my text editor open and I have my browser open. And before we get started, I just wanted to show you the two reference links that you can actually find 
inside the part four forms basics HTML file that corresponds with this lecture. One of them goes to the W3 schools where it just talks about input types. So here you can see HTML input types and the basic form of an input tag is the input tag and then we specify the type. And notice you can have text types, you can have password types, submit types, so it has a little submit button. And later on we're gonna really be exploring a bunch of other types such as radio buttons, drop down, check boxes, etc. So that's the idea behind this. And if you want a more technical reference, you can always check out the Mozilla Developer Network website, which is also linked in that HTML file. But let's get started by just kind of walking through this. So basically, what we do is somewhere in the body, you start your form. So before we actually get started, I'm going to make two headings. I'll say something like login, and then we'll say heading two, please input your, we'll say email and password. Save that, refresh over here, and then we see login, please input your email and password. Let me just zoom in a little bit on that so it's a little clearer. And here we have our two headings. Later on, we're actually gonna learn how to specifically label inputs, but right now, just keeping it basic. Let's simulate a login site. First thing we have to do then is call a form. And if you want, we can actually call form like this, and now we have our form, our opening tag and our closing tag. And we see we have a class, which will make a lot more sense when we talk about CSS. So you can just ignore that for now. We have an action, which is going to be later on used to actually call an action, depending on what kind of form you're using. And then we have a method, which is post. Right now, we actually don't need to worry about any of these things. We're going to talk a lot more about them, but basically the action is later on where we're going to be sending the data. And then the method has to do with a get post HTTP method. But right now, we don't know enough to really use any of these. So we're just going to delete all that and just have form. Let's save that. And let's stick our two headings inside of this form tag. And as I mentioned, the main part of creating a form really revolves around those input tags. So what we're going to do is call an input tag. And then we notice that as we call input and then hit enter, uh, Atom text editor will automatically say type equals name equals and value equals. And so let's break this down. Type is where you actually clarify what type of input you want. And by default, it's type text. And that's something we're gonna be exploring a lot through this lecture and the next couple of lectures, different types of inputs. Then you have the name of the input and the name of the input is just the name assigned to this input. So you can call it on later in some other files. And then we have the value. And the value is the actual default value that's placed inside there. So let's explore this right now. Let's start off with one of the most common types of inputs, which is an email type. And an email type basically just checks to make sure you have an email in there. We'll give this a name and we'll call it user email. So let's save this and refresh. And now we notice that we have an actual text box here. And what's different between a normal type equals text and a type equals email is that the email type is going to make sure later on when we actually click submit that we have an at gmail.com or at yahoo.com or an actual email in there. So for a normal text type input, you could just put in user and it would work. But for a type email, it's going to make sure that you actually have at and then a .com or a .net in there. So maybe you've been using a website you accidentally mistype your email and a little pop-up will say, please enter a valid email address. This is the type of input they're using to automatically do that. And basically all this work is being handled behind the scenes by your browser. Just specifying the type will basically take care of that for you. And that's really a big part of the beauty of HTML. It works across browsers that way, at least for the most common types. And then let's create another input for our password. So we'll say this type is password. We'll save it, refresh, and now you notice that we have two boxes. This was the email and this was the password. But look what happens when I start typing in my password here. It's actually hidden from me. And that sort of default behavior is happening because I specified this type to be password instead of just the default text or an email type. And these are the kind of types right now that you don't need to worry about memorizing them too much. You always have those reference links for the different input types. 
that are in the part four forms basic HTML file, those two links I explained earlier, but eventually you're gonna be using these inputs so often that you're going to just remember off the top of your head, oh, I need an email type, I need a password type, etc. Right now, don't worry too much about memorizing all of these. And let's go ahead and give this input a name. So we will call this just a very simple name, something like password, and that name can later be used to actually reference this. So again, you don't see anything changed here on the HTML form. And finally, let's discuss this value. So the value is if you want a value to be pre-filled there. So let's say email here, and we'll say password, please. Save that, refresh, and notice for the value, it basically has a corresponding default here. So email here, uh, password please. But notice that right now this password please just shows up as a uh, blank password. So it doesn't make a whole lot of sense to input a value here into that. And later on we'll show you some better ways of actually showing uh, some default text there. But that's what you can use if you want it to be pre-filled. All right. And then finally, one of the most important input types is the submit. And we don't need to give that a name or value, but we just refresh, and here we have a little submit button. And this is a little submit, but look what happens here. It says, please include an at in the email address. Email here is missing an at. So let's actually give this type submit a value. And we'll type in submit there, refresh, and notice now the submit button actually has a submit there. And you can call this whatever you want, like please click me, save that, refresh, click me. All right, so let's explain what's going on here because there's uh, only three lines, but there's actually a lot of moving parts. So if we look at this HTML code, everything here is wrapped in form tags. And that's actually really important. That allows HTML to know that we are talking about a complete form here. Then we have three input types. The first one is email, the second one is password, and the third one is submit. And the key idea I want you to just take in right now is not how everything is linked and working together, but really the fact that you can call an input tag, specify a type, give it a name to reference it later on. Right now that doesn't make a whole lot of sense because we haven't really used the name yet. And then the value, which is some default value for it to have. Sometimes the default value doesn't make two sense, such as with a password type, Otherwise you just see a bunch of dots there or asterisks. And then you sometimes really do need a value such as with the submit button where it just looks like an ugly button if you don't have a value there. All right, so this right now, the submit button is linked to these two inputs because if I click, click me, it won't actually work. So it'll say something like, please include an at in the email address. Email here is missing an at. And that's why we wanna specify something like type email. So now if I say, hello at yahoo.com and then put in a password, click me, looks like it's okay. Nothing's actually happening here. It's basically just clearing it uh, every time we click submit. We'll get into that sort of functionality later, how to actually grab information from those input cells. But right now, the very basics is you call a form tag, you call these input tags, you specify a type, you can give it a name, which we'll use later on, and you can give it a default value. Sometimes you're not gonna really want a default value, such as with a password. Sometimes you really will with a submit button. All right, let's just walk through just a couple more examples, some maybe a little sillier examples of different types of inputs. And a really fun one is the choose uh, color input. And it's just a color input. So let me show you what that looks like. I'll say something like choose color as heading one. And heading two is going to be click on button, and then I'm going to specify an input. I'll hit enter there, and the type is going to be a color. So let's save that, refresh this page, and notice here it says choose a color, click on button. And this is a default color picker. So if I click on this button right here, I get this little pop-up that allows me to actually pick a color. So for instance, I can pick this uh, purple color, I hit OK, and we can see it's changed to purple. Or I pick a bright red, hit OK, and I can see it's changed to bright red. So all of that functionality is built straight into HTML just by specifying the type is equal to color. And that's sort of a fun example. Now let's show one more, which is essentially the default. So I'm gonna say heading two, we'll say enter some text, 
and then we'll have some input and we're just going to leave it as the type the text which is the default and we'll say something like text goes here we'll save it refresh and we'll see text goes here which means I can type just random text here and it works just fine let's zoom in a little bit and you can see that there's really no limit on how much text I can write later on we'll learn about things like a text area type which allows us to have a larger section for like paragraphs of text but those are just a few of the input types that you can use as you begin to create forms so just the very basics here that we've covered really all I want you to be aware of is that there's a form tag there are input tags and you can specify the type of input and certain types of input will have restrictions such as the email type will have the restriction that you need an at symbol when you actually click that submit button. That's really all I want you to get out of this lecture for right now. In the next lecture we're going to be talking about two more things. We'll talk about labels and how they work when you can actually label one of these inputs and then secondly we're going to go back and talk about that form with the action and method arguments. Remember that when I first typed in form and I had it autocomplete, it had these calls right here, an action and a method. In the next lecture, we're going to be discussing those and seeing what happens when we combine that with some sort of submit button. Okay, thanks everyone, and I will see you at the next lecture. Our section in the sense that it's actually just the column name. So it represents, uh, and it's in bold versus just a regular text. So we see number, color, country, you can call these whatever you want. And that basically defines how many columns your table is going to have. Now, if we remove this T head, let me just cut that out, save this and refresh, you still get a table just fine. So I don't want to give the impression that every table requires a T head tag. You can build a table without T head, so that's totally fine. But you should try to, at least for a viewer's sake, keep in mind, is it readable without the T head? And here I've put in the T head back in. And for T head, those elements are under the TH tag. Then everything else is a TR for T row, the table row, and then each table cell inside of those rows is just TD. And you have to place them in the order that the columns come in, which is why we choose T head. So we can always make sure we have a reference that corresponds to the actual order of the elements. All right, that's basically it. Thanks everyone, and I will see you in the next lecture.